I'm Alan Fleury with the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences. On this episode of Unscripted, we're visiting with two recent guests of the UGA campus from different parts of the world with unique experiences and viewpoints to share. One, a journalist with many fascinating insights on African politics, literature, and culture. But our first guest is native Canadian novelist Joseph Boyden. A writer of Scottish, Irish, and Anishinaabe heritage, Boyden is the author of three novels and the winner of the Scotiabank Giller Prize, Canada's equivalent of the Pulitzer. His first novel, Three Day Road, tells a fascinating story of two Cree soldiers serving in the Canadian military during World War I. Boyden and I had a chance to talk in the gallery of the Linden House Arts Center in Athens. The history that that novel touches on is really about the deep patriotism of mm -hmm. Canada itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so is that, maybe we should start up back a little bit further. Um, when did you become aware of that history? Well, Canada is very, uh, has, World War I has a very special role in Canadian history. Uh, it's, World War I was, was the first war, the first chance for Canada to come together as a nation. It kind of steeled us as a country, Canadians like to say. It's the first time the four Canadian regiments, uh, divisions came together to fight and, and to do something outside of our country in defense of our country. So it's a big deal, World War I in Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, what I found out in my research is all of this that everyone knows. Canada was only a population of six million people during the First World War. 660,000, so more than one in 10 people volunteered for the Canadian Army of the total population. And of that 660,000 who, who volunteered, 60,000 were killed, so one in 10 were actually killed, and countless more wounded or, or damaged, you know, PTSD, the word shell shock comes from that. Sure. Um, so that's the history everyone knows in Canada. We're very proud of our, you know, of our, of our volunteerism rates and, and our fighting the Hun and all of this uh, and how it made us into a, a, a contemporary country, a modern country. Uh, but I found, as I researched this novel about two young native Canadians who join the war and end up becoming snipers, I found that there's a secret history that no one in Canada really seemed to know. And the secret history is fascinating that despite reserves, the reservation system was, had kicked in. We had something called residential schools in Canada, which, which took the children forcefully from their parents and raised them in, in boarding schools. Mm -hmm. uh, the native population during World War I was not, and right up into the 1960s, was not allowed to practice its culture, its religion, uh, its customs were banned. They were, they were wards of the state. They weren't even considered citizens of Canada until the 1960s is when Indians in Canada got to vote. Um, but meanwhile, what I found out, the secret history, is that even at the, the, the depth of this kind of troubles for First Nations people in Canada, uh, Native men were volunteering at far, far higher rates uh, than any other group per capita in Canada. Young men were volunteering. Oftentimes, reservations, every eligible age man was overseas fighting. And so this made me, I had to question, like, why would this be when you're being treated so horribly right. by a government? Why are you going to put your life on the line, literally, for this government? And this is the kind of questions I had to, uh, had to explore and then discover um, in this novel. Uh, the story, without going into it, really engenders a sort of forward sense of history, one of partnership and cooperation mm -hmm. and diversity instead of the conflict that really readily comes to mind. Right. Right, and this is one of the answers that I discovered is that Native men were joining the army in such great rates because they were going to be treated as equals. Right. And they wanted that, that sense of adventure, but, also, but mostly it was the idea of equality. I will be treated as an equal and I've been promised the vote and, and all of the other uh, uh, benefits that other veterans will get when they ret if they return home. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen until the 1960s, so it took f another 50 years for, for First Nations in Canada to be given those things they were promised in 1914. Uh, the inspiration for Three Day Road is an actual real life, uh, it's not, he's not, he's an inspiration, not, not, the novel is not based on him, but his name was Francis Pegamagabo, and he was an Ojibwe from uh, Wasoxing Reserve Reservation, that's my mom's uh, people's reservation. And he was the deadliest sniper in all of World War I of any country. But Canadians don't know who he is, or didn't know who he was before my novel came out, or many didn't. I'd say 99 out of 100 didn't, kind of thing. But I always say that if he was American, he would have been bigger than John Wayne, you know, in All terms right. of, But Canadians celebrate things in a different way and like to forget about things uh, sometimes. And so, I, you know, part of writing this novel was trying to bring back this kind of his, his spirit, his, uh, what he had done, his sense of heroism within. And I used two characters to kind of represent that mm -hmm. and then and, and try to show, you know, a lot of things, obviously. 
and the response has been good. People have embraced the story. Very much so, in, uh, especially in Canada and in Europe, too. Is this a story of it's their own story? It is their own story, and it's, it's uh, you know, my own little way I shined a light on Canada's history that a lot of people didn't know about. So it's, it's been wonderfully embraced. It came out in 2005. It's, uh, it's on a lot of curriculums in universities and high schools now, so I'm very lucky that way. Um, really, really lucky to uh, have found that success in Canada. And then it did quite well in the States. Uh, Isabella Allende chose it for the Today Show book club, so I got to go on TV my first time ever <laughs> with Isabella Allende on the Today Show. Yeah, wow. so that was it was craziness. And then uh, places like France and Germany, uh, who still see that their history isn't just stuck in the past. That it, you know, you drive through the cemeteries every day, kind of thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's still living for them. And and those countries have really kind of taken in this book. They're fascinated by the idea of, of the Indian sniper sneaking through the trenches and hunting other humans. Right. Were there, do you know if there were Native Americans fighting on the, I know America oh, absolutely. late, but. America came in in 1917 and right. the war ended in 1918, but it was America's push that really ended that war. Right. If America hadn't have come in, I think the war would have ground to a, a horrible halt in years later. No, right. uh, but yeah, First Nations men, same thing. Native men in the U.S. were volunteered at very high rates. Problem is, records weren't very well kept. Um, uh, but if you talk to the people on the reserve, you... They're aware of it. Oh, they're totally aware of it. Uh, they'll have oftentimes monuments and have the list of all the names. And if you know it's a community of 500 and you're seeing 50 names on this monument, it, it's yeah. pretty startling, you know? And, yeah. and this is what you see all across Canada and the United States. And if you speak to people, oh, my great-grandfather was in the World War I, he volunteered. Or uh, my, my uncle was in World War II, volunteered for that war. And then, wow. yeah. So it's a, the, the American history is very similar. And again, a lot of people just don't know it. We always hear about the negatives when sure. it comes to our, our Indian people, our, our, our native people. We hear about the diabetes, the suicide rates, the alcoholism, the addictions. Uh, but what I try to do, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part, I'm Irish, Scottish, and Ojibwe. I'm a mix of them, a bridge. I, I look at myself as a bridge between these two worlds. I try to also introduce you know, s people to the positives, you know, and the, and the, yeah. and the sacrifices right. for a country. It's one of those things where uh, non natives would embrace this idea and perhaps could embrace the people more absolutely. through this. Yeah. Patriotism. Yeah, absolutely. And it's all, for me, personally, it's always about breaking down barriers yeah. between these two cultures that often, or many cultures that often don't see eye to eye on, on certain right. subjects. It's how do we break down that barrier rather than build it up higher. Right. I won't ask you about too many characters, but there's one I want to ask you mm -hmm. just because her role was so interesting to me, and that's Niska. I just found her role really interesting because it seemed, uh, her role and that of her father mm -hmm. seemed to be uh, um, a, a two sort of archetypes that we recognize, but I've never seen in that iteration. Mm -hmm. She seemed to be, and he seemed to be, part chief and part medicine man, mm -hmm. and part something else because yeah. he had such a particular role. All right. Uh, it, when I was, you know, it took me five years to write Three Day Road. It was my first novel. I, uh, I knew I wanted to paint on a big canvas with the first book. I didn't want a little quiet Canadian novel. I wanted something, you know, I was naive at the time. I was young. I was, I, I was young, naive, and had lots of energy. and, and uh, and so I decided to do this, you know, to paint a picture of, of, of a big, big, loud time in our country's history and in world history. And, and I realized that the big, loud, you know, the two boys going off to war and, and everything else, uh, there was something big missing from this story still. And if you read any of my work, you're always going to see that I always have a strong female voice in, in my novels and in my short stories. And that's because I have seven older sisters. So I come by this honestly, this yeah, kind of woman's you voice. Have a strong voice. <laughs> <laughs> Raised by seven amazing strong women and a mother, so eight women. And uh, so I created this character, Niska, who is the auntie of one of the boys who goes off to war. And so I begin the novel with Niska waiting for her nephew to return home mm -hmm. on the train. And she's heard that he's horribly wounded, he's lost a leg. She sees that he's also addicted to morphine, which was actually a po very popular drug uh, at that time. It wasn't illegal. Mm -hmm. Troops actually carried tins of morphine in case they were wounded in battle. So I think there was a lot of morphine addiction. Oh yeah. Um, but this is, was my way of trying to tackle the, the issue of addiction. But anyways, Niska sees her nephew get off the train. He's deeply wounded. She gets him in a canoe to get him home into the bush, and uh, she realizes very quickly he's not going to live. Right. He's, he won't eat. He's shooting this drug into his arm. Uh, he won't talk. He's, he won't, he's, his best friend has gone missing in action. Uh, something's really wrong here. And so rather than feed him f literal food because he won't eat, she begins to feed him stories of her life. And that's how the story of Niska unfolds. She tells the story of her father and his role as a chief and as a healer and of how she became a healer as well, how her family was, dis was taken away by residential school. So she begins to tell him these stories. 
as he relives what happened to he and his best friend over the course of the war. And uh, so Xavier's trying to figure out what happened, where did his best friend Elijah go? He, go? he went missing in the last days. And Xavier's trying to come to terms with what happened to his best friend as Niska tells him the stories. So it's a dual narrative that kind of wraps about itself and, and to its end. So, But Niska, I realized early on, as you, you, know, you asked about Niska, I realized early on my, you know, my seven older sisters are going to be pretty upset if I don't even have a woman's voice in this. So. But she really kind of, Niska was channeled. And it, was, it was pretty amazing writing. You're a writer, so you, you know this idea of we get to be a little bit weird. We get to listen to the voices in our head and, and put them on paper. If it's going well. If it's going well. If it's not, it's, it's horrible. But uh, one day I was sitting in a coffee shop in New Orleans, and an old Native woman started telling me a story in my head. And I typed as fast as I could to tell the stories. And that's how Niska developed in, in my novel. Your books are the winner of a Giller Prize mm -hmm. and other literary awards. Um, Canada seems to have a bit more of a lively literary culture than the US. I feel very blessed to have started my career in Canada. It's, it's a country that really has a, a very lively literary scene. Every autumn, there's festivals right across Canada. So if you have a new book out, you get invited to go from Ottawa to, to Toronto, to Vancouver, to Calgary, right across the country, Winnipeg, all these wonderful festivals. And uh, it's, a really, it's a really living scene. It's a, a vibrant scene in Canada still, the, the book scene. Which makes me very happy, um, and part of that is, I think, that you know we're we're neighbors with a country that's ten times our size, with a, with a, uh, you know, it's our best friends and our neighbors. But the the culture can sometimes overwhelm a little bit. The right. Canadian culture, believe it or not, there's a Canadian culture. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, um, Canada's always supported its arts in order to kind of uh, make sure that our country is being represented amongst ourselves uh, for who we are and what we are. Well, it makes sense. And you've been sending us great musicians for years. Oh, yeah. I hope you'll continue yeah. to send us great writers. Yeah, we're trying. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for doing I appreciate it. No, it was great to meet you. Our next guest is South African journalist, publisher, and DJ, Antone Ajabe. A Cameroonian immigre now based in Cape Town, South Africa, Ajabe is founding editor of Pan-African literary and political journal, Chimaranga, which has published 16 issues since 2002. The magazine includes fiction, reporting, commentary, criticism, and art. In addition to his work as a publisher and writer, Ajabe is one of the leading disc jockeys in the clubs of Cape Town. He curates the Pan-African Space Station, a web-based radio station that streams a constant variety of genres of African music. During his UGA visit, Ajabe gave a chapel lecture and performed a DJ session at the 40 Watt Club. We talked the following afternoon at Ted's Most Best, a restaurant in downtown Athens. So how did you get started writing? Is it something that you always imagined yourself doing, being a journalist? No, not at all. I'm not one of those, <laughs> <laughs> luckily. I think the more fun things to do in life than sitting behind a computer all day. No, that wasn't what I imagined I'd do. I, it became a, a necessity, it became something I felt I could do. I was doing other things, and I thought writing would support some of what I was doing. Well, it's interesting that it's informed by uh, the, uh, the politics of the music, as you say. And I don't think that that's specific to, uh, um, to Africa or, or any countries within it, but it's very closely related. I always felt more comfortable examining society through things that people, that everyone had a relationship with. And I think we all have some kind of relationship with music. Mm -hmm. So I could use music to discuss transformation or lack thereof in any particular place, time, and so forth, because mm -hmm. the music also in some way documented what was happening or what wasn't happening enough. Right. Um, right, the so music was doing this, that, that very thing itself. That's right, that's right. So just finding ways to listen on different levels, you know, appreciating the music for what it is, but also for um, all the other information it contains outside of the music, for instance, where it was recorded, mm -hmm. how it was recorded. So there's so much more data that's contained right. in the packaging of a recording that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to. I mean, something that was recorded or produced in Athens, Georgia in 1985, um, outside of the songs in the records, you know, there are quite a few things about Georgia we could learn how the record was packaged, who produced it, where it was recorded, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Things about class sure. and so forth. Sure. Um, 
So that information started appearing more and more into my writing. Um, and um, I think that's what kind of opened up the, the work I started doing, both in journalism broadly, but also Chimurenga more specifically. As a matter of fact, Chimurenga is called Chimurenga for that relationship. The word means um, revolution struggle. About Chimurenga, that word is important. Uh, and the, the, the meaning that you said, um, revolutionary struggle, but so, I, but I also wanted you to talk a little bit about the language. Mm -hmm. It's a Shona word in the mm -hmm. Bantu language. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk about that, that African word, uh, fa the, that, that language family for a second. Is it, is it regional or is mm -hmm. it sort of an evolution? Because it's part of a larger mm -hmm. language family, right? Mm -hmm. When I heard the term Chimurenga and I found out what the word meant, I thought, well, if I do something, you know, I want to call it Chimurenga because I just love the totality of meanings, you know, everything that it brought in it, the revolutionary struggle in Zimbabwe against colonialism, the popular music that supported that struggle, mm -hmm. the fact that the word itself literally in Shona means in the spirit of Murenga. Murenga was the first kind of, not the first, but the, the best known, it's almost kind of a mythical figure in Shona folklore, he was a, a, a warrior who, who was renowned to be one of the first to confront uh, colonialism towards the late 19th century. So the, he, he was named Murenga. So when the revolutionary struggle itself took off later in the 20th century, the fighters said that they were doing it in the spirit of Murenga, mm -hmm. which literally says Chimurenga. Right. And, and the word has started meaning any kind of confrontation, any kind of attempt to confront the statu quo, the establishment, the oppressor, um, which is all things that I relate to right. uh, politically and philosophically. So thinking about all those things, I thought, wow, it'd be great to have people in South America at some point say Chimurenga. Yeah, it's, it's perfect. Know? Yeah, right, exactly. It's perfect. So. so when I first learned the definition of the word, the first thing I thought of was uh, Franz Fanon. Yeah. And so it sent me back to reading a little bit of that. I found wow. it. Wow. <laughs> so that, that, that book is something that you're definitely familiar with. Yeah. Is that something that the is, wretched of the earth? The, the wretched of the earth, the yeah. Dominate la terre. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Dominate la terre. Yeah. So it's um it's uh, uh very well known throughout the continent. Yeah. Would you say? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's definitely uh, as close to a Bible as you could get for any kind of revolutionary struggle from the 60s onwards. I mean, yes. Everywhere you will go, that will be the kind of guiding test right, for right. examining what is happening and what could happen after what is happening. So uh, now that book always, and he's really, he's rather explicit about this, as is the preface, that it is, it is uh, a book for Africans. Yeah. And I don't mean to conflate the two or compare them, but do you think of Chimaranga the same way? A book for Africans? Yes. No, I think... Uh, Africa yeah, speaking to itself in a way. Maybe yes. I should say a little better. Yes, yes. I think, yes. In that way, I, I agree. I think it's, it's um, Africans speaking. There's agency there, but also Africans speaking uh, with themselves and with the world. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, I feel like um, the idea of... Um, this idea of speech is, I feel you cannot divorce it, this kind of conversation that happens in developing language to be able to express to each other what we are going through. But also in doing that, we are also in conversation with the world. Like it's yes. not an isolated conversation because I think that when you go back to say the 60s and the 70s, the idea of Africans speaking with themselves had this kind of agency was urgent and it was necessary because it was yet it had not been possible until then. Right. But I feel that it's very important to remind ourselves that this conversation is not isolated from whatever conversation we may be having with the rest of the world. So I think I like to have both going together. So it's uh, Africans African speaking with themselves, but also with the world. Uh, in that same realm, do you? How do you? How do you? Uh, um think about the, the post-colonial era that Fanon was working in and thinking about. Where are we in regard to that? 
the, the, there are parts of it that remain and that will for a long time, but there are some things that have changed. For instance, um, the idea that the enemy or whoever one is confronting, the oppressor, is someone that may be coming from outside, is someone that may be a superpower, say the United States or China, you name it, you can choose your favorite enemy. <laughs> um, the idea that whoever may be responsible for our conditions or manipulating in some way, it's an outsider, that is not as relevant today. I mean, I think that there is a growing consciousness in what we do, what we practice, that we are a lot more responsible for what, for our own conditions and right. for ameliorating, taking charge of that, right. than at the time when Fanon wrote The Wretched of the World, because Fanon was trying to analyze how to divorce ourselves from that It was really clear that's right. to blame the, that's the, right. the, the, the uh, colonizing that's power, right. yeah. of course. And, and how does that change the uh, revolutionary struggle as it is? Well, to even speak of a struggle, I'm not sure how correct that is, because, I mean, there's a consciousness that supposes the struggle as we know it is over right because the struggle was clearly against that outside oppressor right and either you've been able to transform or begin to transform as in south africa move from a racial based regime to a more democratic open-minded one or in some cases like say in angola or in mozambique you've been able to espouse the oppressor and so forth so Generally, the notion is that the struggle is over. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things about calling Chimurenga Chimurenga is that for a publication that was founded in 2002 and calls itself Revolutionary Struggle, what struggle are you talking about? Because the struggle is clearly over. Even in South Africa, where I was based, where that publication was born, so it was also to kind of signal that there are other challenges, there are other issues that one could take on that are necessarily closer to home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the essence of other problems that were more pressing is missed entirely. Well, I mean, this is it's just a clear example of how even notions around development and so forth are so narrowly approach, you know, they approach so narrowly through this realm, okay, what is it here that is not there and how can we get there to this, to mm -hmm. match this? Um, well, it's sort of a problem of, of language like you've mentioned. Yeah. Maybe we're approaching it from a, a, a perspective that is not just wrong, but it's not workable. It's not going to get us there if we keep using the same language to talk about these issues. We have a responsibility to form that language. We have a responsibility. I mean, it's a responsibility that we Africans have to take. We cannot rely on the University of Georgia to be able to create the vocabulary that articulates the moments that documents sure. what is really happening in Cape Town or in Nairobi. Or, you right, know. right. So uh, this is a challenge that we have, we have to to take. I yeah. mean, so in a way, I could sit here and blame FIFA, but essentially, right. how, how do you, I mean, yeah, I'm not saying that they're not to be blamed. Of mm -hmm. course, they are to be. There's a bit of conceptual laziness in just assuming that what is required is a stadium, of course, but I think that we have to take up the challenge ourselves also to make, to create that language and use it. What does development mean mm -hmm. in the context such as Nairobi? What does safety mean? What does comfort man, right um, on on those terms right you know as and opposed to those of yeah by the same token what what does news mean sure and I feel like that's what you're beginning to uh, deconstruct or unpack a sure. little bit and I like that what the, the little bit that I've read about changing our approach and changing the way that we even incorporate time as a, as a, a media device mm. is that part of that also like perhaps trying to reimagine some of these issues by changing the way that we describe them and talk about them? This is specifically me. I grew up in a country where the media was the definitely the people you couldn't trust, <laughs> right? They, right? They came with everything but true. So mm -hmm. you begin to distinguish official information and truth, right? right? And 
truth has nothing to do with official information. Anything that the government could be saying, you know, is possibly the furthest away from what the truth could be. Right. And the rumor then begins to exist in a place that is closer to truth. So you have this economy where um, people trust what they hear on the street through a friend and uncle and aunt who is close or closer or presumably the majors claim to be close to power right. and they say well this is going to happen a lot more than what they will read in a newspaper you begin then to think well if we work in this system where fact is fact is the one that you cannot trust and then fiction which is this very subjective thing or take on uh, what may be happening through one person one position, circumstances, oh, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the driver of the minister. And while I was taking him or her to work today, I overheard a discussion that said they will plot the coup. Now, that, that has had more value, right. has a lot more value than what the newspaper is telling you. And of course, that's happening everywhere. We have. It's we shaken have the access. foundations of media exactly. everywhere. Exactly. And I'm suggesting that through these kind of circumstances, we are able to begin to propose some answers that are not coming from the West at all. Because, I mean, what major organizations are doing here at the moment is they're just trying to catch up yeah. more and more. I mean, uh, everyone is trying to come out quicker than Facebook or Twitter or on Facebook and Twitter. Yes. And they're on Facebook and Twitter. Right. Yeah, and, as opposed to reacting by just trying to be first That's or whatever right. and That's increase right. the speed That's and right. let's just get these That's platforms right. in place. That's right. When you talk about technology, it makes me think of something else that I thought about um, in the past couple of days. You know how, um, you, um, you're probably aware of how uh, sustainability is a buzzword in, in Western culture in general and we're starting yeah. to question our, our sort of wasteful nature sure. in a lot of ways. Sure. Our commutes, yeah. the amount of food we buy, vacations, yeah. all kinds of things. I wonder about the perception of that in Africa, and if you think that that perhaps with that struggle that the so-called first world will go through over the mm -hmm. next 15 or 20 years, if the differences between the sort of first and third world will become a little bit more blurred. I th Listen, this is not me, but I mean, there are a couple of theories who are going even further and saying that, I mean, the things are inverting. It's not just about blurring, as in equalizing. Yes. They yeah. just have to move outside of home, so yeah. to speak, whatever it may be, yeah. more as far as Europe or the US or the Middle East even. And they have to start new lives there. I'm, I'm living in South Africa and I've lived there for the past 20 years. So that is happening more and more. Mm -hmm. And necessarily people mix more. Yeah so forth. I think nationalism itself overall is not always a bad thing. I think it's, um, I think the end is just as important as the, the path to it. It can be something that allows people to come together to, to struggle.